Hey, y'all. Uh, greetings, family. This is Brother Baya. It's been a minute since I've done a video. Um, I'm not one who jumps on every week and do videos. I do a video when the spirit leads me to do so. I've been taking a lot of time to just do a lot of researching. You know, I've been reading a lot of books, watching a lot of other people's videos and sharing a lot of stuff with family members and friends who are kind of sitting on the bubble when it comes to this awakening. Um, something just kind of inspired me to do this teaching on the 400 year prophecy because there's still a lot of our people that's sitting on the fence about this. For some of you, this is gonna be preaching to the choir, I know, but there's still a lot of our people that are caught up into religions and who have been taught things that are not scriptural, but because we believe the narrative that was fed to us over generations that some of us still believe the lies. And so I wanted to, I had actually put together some scriptural references and a chart of my own to kind of help me to process whether or not this biblical prophecy in Genesis 15 verses 12 through 14 and the one in Exodus 12 verses 40 and 41 are one and the same or two different prophecies. You know, I want to give a shout out to the Brothers of Salt of the Earth Productions. They've done hours and hours of videos on the 400 year prophecy. Also to Benaya Israel, he's got a video out that he touched on the subject. Dante Fortson also touched on the subject. He's got a chart that he's put together on his uh, web page, uh, well done chart, and many other people who have dealt with this subject. So what I hope to show in my own way is that these are two different prophecies that have been conflated together as one. And so by the grace of the Most High and by the moving of the Holy Spirit, I'm hoping that for many who are in the churches who are still kind of on the fence about this, you know, about this prophecy and when does it apply? Did it happen already? You know, it's, it's a lot of confusion out there. And so the Bible tells us in the last days that knowledge is going to increase, and it has. The internet has a, a, a made it possible for us to circumvent the mainstream media who are controlled and is used to feed us narratives that favor a particular storyline that is not true. And so it is my prayer that when we go through this together, that you will see that the math doesn't lie. There's a saying in the math world or in the world of accounting that liars figure, but figures don't lie. And that is a true statement that the math is the math. You can twist scripture. You can take verses out of context, but the math is going to be the math. And in my years of Christianity, there were things in the Bible that just didn't make sense. And so it kept me pressing to try to find truth. And now as the Most High has opened my eyes, that things now are starting to make sense. And so I'm hoping that through this study that we can come to a greater understanding of whether or not this prophecy of 400 years occurred in the ancient times or did it occur in more recent times. So I'm gonna share my screen 
And this is called the 400 year prophecy. The math doesn't lie. The math doesn't lie. In Isaiah chapter 46 and verse nine, declaring the end from the beginning, it says, remember the former things of old for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasures. In the Bible, most of your modern day Bibles are going to have references to this 430 year prophecy. But there is a book that, and I must admit that I didn't really know much about the Septuagint or even the apocryphal books uh, until I came into this truth. And as I began researching, I began to realize that there's so much information out there that have been kept basically not so much hidden, but when you grow up or grew up reading only the King James version of the Bible and some of the other translations that are much newer and basically copy the same information from the same sources, carrying over the same in the, the same faulty information, then you come to accept that information as being factual. Now the Septuagint is defined as quite possibly the most important translation of the Bible. It is the oldest translation of the Old Testament into another language. The term Septuagint means 70, actually refers to the 72 translators, some say 72 rabbis, six from each tribe of Israel involved in translating the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is attributed to Moses, but that's even debatable by some, from the Hebrew to Greek in the third century BCE. 72 is rounded down to 70, Hence the Roman numeral LXX or 50 and X and X is 10 and 10, so it's 70. Now, when I was getting ready to do this study, something that dawned on me that I didn't notice before, but if this translation occurred in the third century before common era, then my question is, what happened or when was the Northern tribe, the 10 tribes, the Northern kingdom, when were they kicked out of the land? That was around 722 BCE. And so if that, the tribes were already out of the land in 722 or BCE, almost 400 years later, how are you able to get six people, whether they're rabbis or just translators from each of the 12 tribes? Food for thought. But once again, a lot of times we don't really stop and question things. We just take them at face value. So anyway, the Septuagint is considered to be one of the oldest translation of the Hebrew text into Greek. And then, you know, we have further translations from Greek to Latin, from Latin to English. But there's a reason why I brought up the Septuagint. Now, the 400 year prophecy in Genesis 15 and 12 states, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterward shall they come out with great substance. I remember as a young man watching the epic movie from Cecil B. DeMille, The Ten Commandments. 
probably most of us have seen that movie. It was a classic back in the days. But I never really researched who Cecil B. DeMille was. And so when I Googled him and looked in his lineage, especially along his mother's lineage, you will find that it connects to a certain people. And so it makes sense that he is also vested in spinning this narrative that the 400 years occurred in ancient Egypt. So Charlton Heston played the role of Moses, a tan down Charlton Heston, <laughs> a tan down Yul Brenner played the role of Ramses. And one of the classic tagline in the movie was, well, we've been doing this dance for 400 years and 400 years and he, he doesn't know how to move after 400 years. But they made it a point to repeat that line 400 years. And so you would believe, and I did for many years, that they spent 400 years, the Israelites in ancient Egypt. Well, we're gonna find out that that is not the case. The 430 year prophecy, which is the other prophecy that's been conflated together with the previous one. And those who are trying to paint this narrative have squashed them both together and say that this is the same prophecy. This is what just really sometimes gets under my skin, right? Because we tend to put the most high in our little finite boxes and view him through the lens of our little human minds. We make it seem like the most high does not know how to do math. We make it seem like when he says 400 years, oh, he meant 430. But the most high is a mathematical genius. It's, he is precise when it comes on to the numbers. Numbers are specific when it comes to the most high. He doesn't make a mistake. When he says 400 years, he meant 400 years. When he said 430 years, he meant 430 years. When he said 70 years, he meant 70 years. He is not a man that he should lie. And so in Exodus 1240, it says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So here is where the deception begins. The scriptures above shows that the Elimo or the God that we serve has revealed through his word the things that is to come upon his people and what would happen to the earth at the end of days, thousands of years later. Those who are in search of truth will pay heed to this, to his word and govern our lives accordingly. One of the major prophecies concerning his people, people and what were to transpire with them was revealed in the scriptures below. There are two independent prophecies that has been merged together by wicked Bible translators that deliberately manipulated the scriptures to support a narrative that the 400 year prophecy has already occurred in ancient Egypt. It is important that we understand these prophecies because they have everything to do with what is occurring around the world today and what is ahead for us. I wanted to closely take a look at these two prophecies and determine whether they both have been fulfilled. Let's examine the prophecy of Exodus 1240 first because chronologically it occurs before the one in Genesis 15, verse 12 through 14. And so 430 does not equal 400. Exodus 12, 40, once again, says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame evening day that it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. 
And so right away, we have a problem with the text. Most modern translations of the Bible have the text stating the sojourn in Egypt was 430 years. This, however, is incorrect and was done deliberately. Now, taken from the Septuagint, this, uh, what I'm reading, is going to be from the ex Sefer Bible. Many of us in the Israelite community, we had bought this particular Bible because it restored a lot of the, the biblical names and things. And, you know, after doing some research, I have some issues with that. But, you know, for now, this is where this reading is taken from. Exodus 12 and 40 says, Now the sojourn of the children of Yasharel, or Israel, who dwelt in the land of Misraim and in the land of Canaan, or Canaan, they and their fathers was 430 years. You will see here that in the that the line in the land of Canaan or Canaan was conveniently omitted. In the Septuagint, and you can go online, there are many free uh, versions of the Septuagint, some you can download. In the Septuagint, the time of the sojourn of the children of Israel was divided between the land of Canaan and Egypt. So let's examine the timeline and see if it corroborates with the text in the unedited version of the Septuagint. So let's take a look at Abram's journey where it began in Genesis 12 and verse 4. It says, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. Uh, Genesis 12 and verse 7 says, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, or unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So we will begin looking at the chronology from this point, because this was the beginning of Abram's departure from the land of Haran to the land of Canaan, as instructed by the Most High. Bear in mind that he was 75 years old. He was 75 years old. There, I think I spelled that wrong. Um, but he was 75 years old, OK? So this portion, we're going to deal with the 430 years or the first half of it, right? So Genesis 21 and 5 says, and Abram was 100 years old when he and his son, when his son Isaac was born unto him. So 25 years went by before Isaac was born in the land of Canaan. So let's keep that number in mind. At 25 years, he was 75 when he left Haran. He was 100 when Isaac was born. <laughs> Excuse me. Genesis 25 and verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare him. So Isaac was 60 when they had Jacob and Esau. So 60 years went by when Jacob and Esau was born. So keep that number in mind. Genesis 47 and 9. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Okay, so Jacob when he was introduced by Joseph to Pharaoh and Pharaoh asked him, how old are you? He said, I'm 130 years old. Okay. So bear that number in mind because we're going to do some math with these numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. So now let's do the math. Now, Jacob, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel, arrived in Egypt and was introduced by Joseph to Pharaoh when Jacob was 130 years old. So let's just do some simple addition. Let's add up the 25 years that went by from Abram was 75 years old and received the promise in Haran 
until Isaac was born in the land of Canaan when he was 100 years old. We're going to add that to the age of Isaac when he had Jacob and Esau, when he, Isaac, was 60 years old. And then finally, we're going to add the age of Jacob when he was introduced to Pharaoh, which was 130 years old. So when you add the 25 years to the 60 years and to the 130, you get 215 years. So the time of the sojourn of Abram or Abraham and the Israelites in the land of Canaan was 215 as demonstrated in the math above. So now we can take a look at the time that they sojourned in Egypt beginning from this point. Okay, so I hope that was clear to you all. Abraham left at 75 years old, Haran at 75. 25 years later, he had uh, Isaac. And then when Isaac was 60, he had Jacob and Esau. And then when Joseph introduced Jacob to Pharaoh, he was 130. So 25 plus 60 plus 130 equals 215, which corresponds with the Septuagint. So now let's look at the chronology of the life of Joseph. Genesis 41 and 46 said, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Okay, so we know the story that Pharaoh had the dream about the seven lean ears and the seven uh, uh, fat ears and the seven kind, lean kind. And so when no one could in interpret his dream, it was remembered by, I forget whether the, it was the butcher or the baker, one of them had gotten killed. Um, but they said, yeah, there's this Jew that, you know, interpreted my dream. And so I think he can interpret your dream. And so they brought him before Pharaoh and he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh placed him in charge of taking care of the, the supply of grain during the seven plenteous years and during the time of the famine because of Joseph's wisdom. So uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. And so now you have the seven years of plenty. Now in Genesis 45 and five, it says, now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither for God did send me before you to preserve life. So this was when Joseph was finally reunited back with his brothers. They didn't recognize him at first. And we know the whole drama that went on. But when they finally recognized who he was, he told them who he was. He said, listen, don't, don't trip out about you selling me into slavery. You meant it for my harm. But the most high meant it for my good. Because by sending me here, he gave me an opportunity to prepare so that you guys can be preserved. Your life can be preserved during these times of famine. Verse 6 says, for these two years hath the famine been in the land. And yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. So what he was saying was that now we're two years into the famine. We had the seven years of plenty. Now we're two years into the famine. There's still five more years of the famine to go. So we see here that Joseph was 30 when he was made the viceroy of Egypt. He managed the seven years of plenty. And after two years of famine, his brothers came into Egypt to get grain and was reunited with Joseph when he was 39 years old. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. This is Genesis 50, verse 22. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. So now there arose, and Exodus 1, verse 8 says, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph right? And so you have to look at the fact that he was 110 when he died, but he was 30 and nine when his brothers came into Egypt. So we're going to do some math with those numbers in a second. Exodus 30, I'm sorry, Exodus 13 verse 19 says, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones away from hence with you. Okay, so the maximum time of captivity. So we see that Joseph was 110 years old when he died in Egypt. 
When you subtract Joseph's age at the of 39 when his family came into Egypt from his age at death of 110, excuse me, you get 71 years. When you add those 71 years to the 215 years that we calculated earlier, you get 280 and six years. And so what that does now, it would leave you with 144 years remaining to the the balance of the 430 year prophecy. So given this calculation, there are effectively only 144 years that they could have possibly been enslaved in Egypt. Because during Joseph's lifetime, that never occurred. We don't know how long before a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph came into power because the scripture does not tell us that. But we will look at some more chronology that might clue us in so let's look at the lineage of Moses for those clues. So bear that 144 number in mind. Now, I'll just add this at this point that we could either have done addition, which I did here by adding the 71 years of Joseph's life from the time the brothers came in when he was 39 till he died at 110 to the 215 years that gave us the 285 years. Um, uh, 280 and six years that uh, we calculated. But you could also subtract that 71 years from the remaining 215, and you're going to come up with the same 144 years. And we'll do that. Um, uh, I did that math later on in the slides. So we're going to look at the life um, and the chronology of the life of Moses. Now, in Genesis 46 and 8, it said, and, there, and these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons. So it's showing you that Jacob and all his sons came into Egypt, right? Genesis 46 and 11 says, and the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And we're going to focus on Kohath because Kohath is the father or the grandfather, excuse me, of Moses and Aaron. And the sons of Kohath, Amram, and Ishar, and Hebron, and Uziel, uh, and the years of the life of Kohath were 130 and three years. So we see Kohath lived 133 years, and within that period, he begat Amram, which was the father of Moses. And so in Exodus 6 and 20, and Amram took Jochebed, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him, Aaron and Moses, and the years of the life of Amram were an hundred and thirty and seven years. Exodus 7 and 7 says, and Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three, fourscore is 80, and Aaron was fourscore and three, 83 years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. So Kohath was the grandfather of Moses and Aaron, Amram was their father. If Kohath was a baby when they entered Egypt and had his son Amram when he was a baby, and Amram had Moses when he was a baby, and you add up all their combined years until the exodus of the children of Israel when Moses was and Aaron was 80, or well, Moses was 80, Aaron was 83, you get this. You got the 133 years of Kohath and the 137 years of Amram and the 80 years of Moses when they left, the maximum amount of years that the children of Israel could have spent in Egypt was 350 years. So just based on this example, the maximum amount of time that they could have spent in Egypt was 350 years, as I said. And obviously Moses' grandfather, Kohath, was not a baby when he had Amram, the father of Moses. And Amram was not a baby when he had Moses. So the time would have been considerably less than 350 years. There are two other points to make here concerning the age of Moses. His mother placed him in the basket and put him into the Nile River because of the death sentence pronounced by Pharaoh upon the male newborn children of the Israelites. He was 40 when he fled after killing the Egyptian. So the point here being that it's possible that at Moses' birth was when the affliction began or could have started a little bit before, but we don't know that. But like I said, we're going to do some math that's going to help us 
to kind of target in or clue in a little bit more as to how long they could have spent in Egypt. We know they only had 215 years left of the 430 year prophecy because 215 years of that had already occurred in the land of Canaan. So now the math doesn't lie. So we established earlier, we established that Joseph died at the age of 110. When we subtracted his age of 39 years, when his family came into Egypt, you get 71. When we subtract that 71 from the remaining 215 years of the 430 years of the prophecy of Exodus 12 and 40, you get 144 years remaining. So we can deduce that if the Israelites were enslaved and afflicted immediately after the death of Joseph, the maximum time of this affliction before the Exodus would have been 144 years. That's far removed from 400 years. When you subtract the age of Moses at the Exodus from that 144 years, you get this, 144 minus 80 is 64 years. So there's a 64 year period that is a gap that the Bible doesn't really explain what occurred during that 64 years. But what we do know is that within that 64 years, that a Pharaoh that came into power that did not know Joseph or did not honor what Joseph did, because to me, within 64 years, the story of what happened in Egypt would have still been fresh in the minds of the Egyptians. But because he didn't know Joseph and did not honor Joseph, that some at some point was where the affliction began within that gap. And so um, a pharaoh that knew that not Joseph had come into power, so that would have reduced the time also. So to sum this up, if you take the 71 years of Joseph's life after the arrival of his brothers into Egypt, and you add to that the 80 years when Moses led the Exodus and the 64 year gap, you get 215 years, 71 plus 80 plus 64 equals 215 years. So once again, that jives perfectly with the Septuagint's account of the 430 years. 215 in Canaan, 215 in Egypt. But we're gonna do some more uh, calculations, right? This is the actual chart that I did that shows you all of the math that I just showed you, <coughs> excuse me. So here in this chart, you can see Abram was 75 and all the scriptures are here. So I'm not gonna repeat them all, but Abraham leaves Haran at the age of 75. And then 25 years later, Isaac is born when Abraham was hundred. And then 60 years later after Isaac is born, when Isaac was 60, he had Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob, when he was introduced by Pharaoh, uh, by Joseph, excuse me, to Pharaoh, he told Pharaoh that he was 130 years old. So the total time in Canaan was 215 years, 25 plus 60 plus 130 equals 215. And then when you take Joseph's age of, of 30, when he stood before Pharaoh. And then when his family came, he was 39, right? Then you will see that the Israelites entered Egypt after the 215 years in Canaan. And then Joseph dies at the age of 110, which was 71 years later. So he was 39 when his brothers came there. 71 years later, Joseph dies. So if you take the 215 and you subtract the 71, you're gonna get 144 years, all right? But then the Israelites was enslaved somewhere within that period of time, plus or minus 64 years, right? Because I showed you that when you subtract Moses's age from that 144 years, you're going to have the 64 year period that was not really talked about in the Bible, what happened during that 64 years. But within that 64 years was when the Pharaoh rose at Nunah Joseph 
and when the Israelites became enslaved. So over here, I've got the 215 minus the 71 years of Joseph's life after his brothers came into Egypt, 144 years. And now you can, if you were to split that 64 years in half, you would get 112. So the maximum would have been 144, or if you split the 64 in half, you get 112. So what I'm showing you here is that doesn't matter which way you do the math, it does not equate to 400 years. And then down here, we've got Kohath, um, the father, uh, Moses' grandfather, um, one of the 66, some people say 70, depends on where you read, that entered into Egypt, that he, he lived to be 133 years. Amram, who was Moses' father, the son of Kohath, lived to be 137 years. And Moses was born and placed in the Nile when he was uh, um, at some point. And then when he was 80 was when they left out of Egypt. So if you were to take the 133 years of Kohath's life, his grandfather, the 137 of his father's lifespan, and you add that to the 80 years of Moses um, when he left out of Egypt, the maximum years that you stretched all of that out was 350 years. But we know once again that children don't have children. And so it would have been considerably less time that the children of Israel spent in Egypt. And so um, in conclusion, what I've tried to prove here is that the prophecy of Exodus 1240 about the sojourn of the children of Israel in Egypt and the Canaan was in line with the Septuagint and not the version of the Bible that omitted the line and the land of Canaan from the text. 215 years in Canaan, 215 years in Egypt. What is clear here is that this prophecy in Exodus 1240 is a different prophecy than the one written in Genesis 15 verses 12 through 14. I tried to meticulously demonstrate to you through the chronology of the ages of the children of Israel, beginning with Abram and ending with Moses, as written in the text proves that the prophecy of the 400 year captivity in Genesis 15 verses 12 through 14 was not, was not fulfilled in ancient Egypt. This is HR 1242. And once again, in the conscious community, everyone knows of this um, house legislation. This is HR 1242, 400 years of African-American History Commission Act. HR 1242 would establish a commission to plan activities and provide grants, <coughs> excuse me, to develop programs and events to commemorate 400 years of African-American history in the United States. Even the American government acknowledges that the Africans and their descendants have been present in this land where they were enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. I've heard Nancy Pelosi talk about this 400 years. Many of the politicians have mentioned this 400 years. There's a 1619 project that talks about the 400 years. So um, there are many sources that acknowledges that, there, that the descendants of slaves have been in this land for 400 years. And I know I've heard all the arguments, well, what about the Arab slave trade that started before the transatlantic slave trade and blah, blah, blah. And yes, there were slaves before 1619 and blah, blah, blah. Listen, the most high, he knows when to establish a timeline and he has his starting point and he has his ending point. He knows how to do math. He exists out of time but he places things in time for our benefit. And so there was a starting point of this 400 year captivity, 1619, and an ending point of 20 and 19. There is no other time in history that encapsulates a 400 year of affliction and mistreatment of a people than what we have experienced here in this land called America. Um, 
For those of you who still do not believe that we are the Israelites, please re-examine the curses of Israel in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68, and juxtapose it against the prophecy of Genesis 15, verses 12 through 14. Ask yourself what people group, people group, I'm not talking about individuals, but as a nation of people have experienced these curses collectively more than people of African descent. Combine this with the awakening of people of African descent that is occurring all around the world to their Hebraic lineage and heritage, and it paints a picture for those whose eyes are open. I'm going to stop sharing here. I know that there's all kinds of fights going on, those who are quote unquote in the urban apologetics community are saying, no, 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 you black people, you cannot be the Israelites. Even though um, those who are on the continent, and I've met many brothers and sisters who have shared their ancient cultures and traditions, and they are many, that connects directly to the Bible things such as the rites of purification, the leveret marriages, uh, they, 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 the women who are on their menses who are have to be separated for a certain time from the rest of the tribe, um, things such as circumcision on the eighth day, the naming of children on the eighth day, the uh, not eating of pork, the honoring of the Sabbath, the lembas are known to have highly Hebraic traditions, the Ashanti, the Ebos, Henry Kissinger in his memo to Richard Nixon called the Ebos the wandering Jews of West Africa. And I can go on and on and on, but there's enough evidence out there showing that people of African descent have been practicing Hebraic traditions long before the white man came to the continent of Africa. They try to say, oh, they must have come in contact with the Hebrews at some point and, and adopted their tradition. It's, it's, listen, once again, liars figure, but figures don't lie. These people have been practicing these things for thousands of years long before the white man came onto the continent. So people can believe what they want to. I'm just here to show you that the prophecy of Genesis 15, 12 through 14 did not occur in ancient Egypt. And the one in Exodus 12 and 40 and 41 was deliberately, deliberately combined into one contiguous time of 430 years. And in all the modern translations, it says the sojourn of the children of Israel would be in the land of Egypt for 430. That is not correct, as was demonstrated in the Septuagint, as well as by the math that I did. So I just wanted to bring this point out and give the scriptural references so that you can do the math yourself. Like the Bereans, they believe what Paul said, but they search the scriptures daily to find out if, they, if, if what he was saying was true. And we have to be like the Bereans. <clears throat> the Bible said that when the spirit of truth has come, he would lead us into all truth. Jesus, Isaiah, Yeshua, Yahawashai, whatever you all choose to call him, said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. The father himself said, he is not a man that he should lie. So when the father is all about truth, the son is all about truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. How can we say that we are servants of the most high who is all about truth, but yet we're abiding in lies and falsehoods? That bothers me because I believe that I'm not a theologian. I didn't go to Bible seminary school. I don't have doctorates or master's degree in divinity. But if I can search the scriptures and find these texts and do the math. Why are our pastors and preachers and teachers still 
teaching that this ancient prophecy occurred in Egypt. That means they're not abiding in truth. And so I have to question if you are truly moving by the spirit of truth when you are not abiding in truth. There's going to be many people who's going to come before in the most high one day and said, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name and do that in your name? He's not talking about ungodly people or pagans who don't know him. That scripture is talking about people who claim to know the father. But when we avoid the truth, when we skirt the truth, and when we distort the truth, we are going to be held accountable because many people are, are avoiding the truth because they're afraid that their congregations can't handle the truth or they're going to lose members if they begin to speak the truth or they're going to lose friends or in the business world they're going to lose because there's a people who is benefiting from the lies and so i'm just going to leave it at that and so i just want to thank you all for listening i shared what the math shows you and it is the truth whether you want to accept it or not it is the truth there was no 400 year prophecy fulfilled in the land of egypt in the ancient egyptian captivity and i believe that i've proven that without the shadow of a doubt just using i could have gone into some of the apocryphal books and some in some of the other teachings that i mentioned at the beginning some of the brothers they actually go into some of these other books but many people are saying, oh, I don't, I don't believe in the Apocrypha. I don't believe in these different books. I stick to the King James Version of the Bible. Okay, fine. That's what I use. I didn't go into the Apocryphal books. So you can believe what you choose. I've given you the truth as the Most High has shown me, as the scriptures have shown. And this is not just for us in the conscious community. It is for Christians who are sitting on the fence. It is for Gentiles who are truly in search of the truth and whose heart is open to receive the truth. We've all been lied to by a cunning adversary who is the father of lies. And those whom he controls are the ones who he's using to prop up the lies. So you have to determine whose sheep are you? Whose sheep are you? And are you going to receive the truth or you're going to stay in the realm of cognitive dissonance and reject the truth because it makes you uncomfortable. Well, you know what? All throughout the scripture, when the truth became uncomfortable, the, the persons who brought forth the truth was attacked and sometimes even killed because the people didn't want to hear the truth. Are you one of those who would have stoned the prophets back in the days because they brought you the truth? And now when people are bringing you the truth, you don't want to receive it or you want to attack the people. Oh, this is nonsense. This is not true. Well, do the math yourself. So anyway, if this, if this uh, has been a blessing to you, I pray and hope that you would like the video, share the video. Um, if you have any comments you want to make on the video, that's fine. You know, um, I'm just here to share. And, um, you know, if Mosai should lead me to do more videos, I will do more videos. But like I said, I don't do stuff. I'm not here to be a YouTube prophet or, you know, um, there's enough voices out there. And some of them are doing really, really good job. But there's a lot of falsehoods out there, too. And the Bible said in the last days, many false prophets are going to arise and going to deceive a lot of people. But even and, and even the very elect. But the only thing that will keep the very elect from being deceived is the spirit of the most high who he's placed within us to lead us and to guide us into what is true and what is false. And so I hope this has been a blessing to you. And until um, I am inspired to do another video, may the most high bless you and keep you and make his face and his countenance to shine upon you. And may he give you his his salama or his peace.